because you'd be pretty hard pressed to tell the difference between Australian cool climber Chardonnay and Chablis. From Burgundy, wow. Are there particular regions that you love for the Chardonnay in Australia? There's good Chardonnay made all over Australia. You would be looking at the Adelaide Hills, Margaret River, Tasmania, Victoria, Mornington Peninsula, Yarra Valley. Yeah. I've been to Australia twice. It's one of my favorite experiences, just everything, the wine, the food, the sun, the beaches. <laughs> yeah. What's old is new again. And in Australia, we have this great tradition of blending Cabernet and Shiraz, and they've really come back into vogue. Grenache as well is really having a moment. So there's lots happening here, really. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 176. Are you curious about the Australian wine scene and the latest trends and changes? How about some tips on buying terrific Australian wines? And what are some iconic Australian food and wine pairings you should try? You'll hear those stories and tips and more during part two of our chat with James Atkinson, host of the Drinks Adventures podcast. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much. So in previous episodes, I talked about the importance of a book's title and cover. Well, next up is the back cover blurb. This is usually a few paragraphs that gives just enough info to make a prospective reader want more. It includes a bit of the story, the stakes involved for the protagonist, hero or anti-hero, and some of the more universal themes explored. I think of it as the extended elevator pitch. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> it was actually one of the hardest things to write, even after drafting my book, and I'm still working on it. Here's the current version, and please excuse the immodesty to follow because this is meant to be salesy. Ugh. Natalie McLean is a best selling wine writer married to a high powered CEO when everything goes wrong. Dun, dun, dun. No, there's no music. Her husband of 20 years suddenly and mysteriously leaves. Just when she's feeling vulnerable, she faces an onslaught of sexist attacks from an online mob. These two events force her to choose whether to retreat into bitterness, despair, and overdrinking, or rally to reclaim her son, career, and self-worth. Natalie chronicles the worst vintage of her life with vulnerability, honesty, and humor, laying bare the toxic masculinity at the heart of the wine industry. The darker moments of the book are balanced with her escapades dating zero-effort men, zems, and wine-soaked get-togethers with girlfriends. This memoir reveals larger truths about the cyber-misogyny women face, the slick marketing encouraging them to drink too much, and the societal pressure to conform when they blaze their own trail. This is the true story of one woman's quest to find the magic inside herself to transform her life and love. Roll that end music. <laughs> so that's it. So an earlier version of this blurb didn't say it was a memoir or a true story, which it is both. So when I asked for feedback from a private writer's Facebook group, one of the first comments was, why are you naming the lead character after yourself? <laughs> he thought it was fiction. And sometimes I think my life during that one year was something out of a mystery novel or maybe even a horror story. <laughs> but as they say, truth is stranger than fiction. 
I also worried that that blurb would alienate every man who picks up the book. However, there have been a number of men who have read the book as beta readers, and they haven't been put off. One of them is John from Beaverton, Oregon. Here's what he said. I enjoyed it. I appreciated the humor and vulnerability. This is a story of strength, redemption, growth, and healing. It's also heartbreaking and an unfortunate reminder of what too many women have suffered. I found myself rapidly page-turning to get to the next turn in the story. I also related to a lot of her story. One of my daughter's softball teammates plans to pursue a career in winemaking, and I plan to gift her a copy of this memoir, as I think she'll benefit from Natalie's experience. It's a great message for for any woman interested in a career in a male-dominated industry. The book leaves the reader filled with a sense of hope that despite tough circumstances and the odds stacked against them, they can rise from the ashes as well. Thank you, John. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 176. This is where I share more behind-the-scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemclean.com. In the show notes, you'll also find my email contact, the full transcript of my conversation with James, links to his website and podcast, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 176. Okay, on with the show. So let's shift now back to wine. Actually, let's make the transition. Do you see any parallel trends happening in the world of wine and the world of beer? Is anything in common trend-wise that you're noticing anywhere? It doesn't have to be Australia. Yeah, I mean, I guess the change that's kind of happened in beer in the last few decades, you know, the craft beer movement that kind of began in the U.S. and really swept the globe, driven by a younger generation of people who were sort of sick of realized that beer had become this flavorless kind of product i'm talking about the bud lights of this world and those sorts of things that just don't really have much flavor and you know they sort of were motivated by flavor I mean, making beer something new making beer their own i suppose there's a parallel there with the natural wine that we see now right sort of a younger generation of people seeing what was already out there in the way of wine and finding it a bit too staid and uninteresting for them and kind of creating a new subgenre of wine for themselves. Mm, that's a good analogy. Cans have really taken off in craft beer as well, and canned wine is kind of having a bit of a moment now as well. So, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and canned wine surprised me. It's not only so much better for the environment over bottles, but the way they make it today, it does not affect the taste of wine. Like it's got the special linings and all kinds of things and much lighter to transport. And I think it's a good trend. And so are natural wines a big trend in Australia? Yeah, they are. I mean, I think, you know, if you were to look at it as a percentage of volume, it would be small, but they make a lot of noise, the natural wine movement. And where I am in Sydney, there's a few bars that sort of specialize in it and a few bottle shops that specialize in it. And what's your take on natural wines? What's your personal opinion? (laughs) (laughs) Personally, I'm not a massive fan of the wine just because it's natural. Like for me, it's just about whether it's good or not. And I think some of the producers that make the best natural wine probably aren't even calling themselves natural wine. They're just wine and they just do what they can to minimize inputs and all that kind of stuff. So I've been pretty disappointed too many times with a lot of natural wines that I've paid over the odds for and to be poorly made. And it's almost like I think calling it natural can be an excuse to put something on the market that just isn't up to scratch. There have been exceptions. I have had some good ones as well. So you need to be in the hands of maybe a good sommelier who really knows their stuff and really understands quality. And there are some good examples out there, and they can be very food-friendly wines as well. Well put. 
So tell us a bit about the Australian wine industry as it stands today. Do you have any sort of key stats that would help us understand the size of it in terms of how much wine is being produced these days? Yeah, I think last year I had to do this research for you, Natalie, and it was 165 million nine-litre case equivalents, so 12 bottle cases. So I think maybe you talk about bottles over there, we tend to talk about cases. So whatever 12 times 165 million is, that's how... It's a lot. Yeah. that's a, Well, that sounds like <laughs> yeah. a big number. You might know better than I do how that sits in a global context. Yeah. I'm not sure of all the stats off the top of my head. It's definitely more than we produce here in Canada. But yeah. Is most of it exported or do you consume most of it domestically? I think maybe it's kind of about 50-50. I think last I checked, export was almost half of the production. Mm-hmm. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, the industry's kind of been rocked here by the China trade tariffs that were introduced a year or maybe it was probably, yeah, it was in the last 12 months that they were actually introduced. A bit of a diplomatic spat between China and Australia and they just overnight introduced these tariffs that have made Australian wines so expensive in China that the markets just disappeared overnight and that was our biggest market well over $1 $1 billion worth of annual trade with China, and that's sort of disappeared overnight. So pretty tough times, yeah, for Australian wine. Holy smokes. And any other trends you're seeing in Australian wine today, aside from the natural wines, anything else emerging, grape styles, regions, anything like that? Yeah, look, there's probably a few. I think it's been talked about a lot, the resurgence of Australian Chardonnay and in a more modern contemporary style. Australian Chardonnay probably had a bit of a bad name, you know, maybe in the 80s and 90s and was just kind of known for those really sort of rich, buttery, over-oaked, 100% malo type Chardonnays. Malolactic fermentation yeah, for those who sorry. aren't as geeky yeah. as we are. No, that's okay. But it makes the wine even more buttery. It takes out the harsher lactic acids and turns them into malo acids. It makes it all very buttery, but it can become too buttery and goopy as well. You know, the wines were really deep yellow in colour, I think, as well. And, you know, I think maybe you'd probably say 15 years ago, roughly, I would say, is when the movement kind of started to, oh, hang on, should we be picking as late as this? Should we be spending that much time in New Oak with these Chardonnays? Are we really showcasing the site that these wines are from? So there's just been a whole revolution style-wise with Australian Chardonnay. I think people sort of talked about a few years ago, it went too far. It went kind of too far to really bonesy sort of styles, but lacked fruit a bit and were kind of really driven by that sort of sulfide struck match kind of note that you get. And now I think things have come back. You know, the pendulum has sort of swung back a bit and things of Australian Chardonnay is just in a brilliant place right now where you've got the sort of balance between winemaking technique and fruit expression, terroir expression, and some of these wines, people sort of talk about how you, these days you'd be pretty hard-pressed to tell the difference between Australian Cool Climber Chardonnay and Chablis in some ways. Wow, so. from Burgundy, wow. Are there particular regions that you love for the Chardonnay in Australia? There's good Chardonnay made all over Australia, really, in a lot of our top wine regions. But I think the sort of cool climate examples that I'm talking about, you would be looking at the Adelaide Hills, you'd be looking at Margaret River, you'd be looking at Tasmania and also Victoria, Mornington Peninsula, Yarra Valley, places like that. Right. Yeah, no, I have to return to those areas as well. I just love cool climate wines. Yeah. I've been to Australia twice, actually. It's one of my favorite experiences, just Everything, the wine, the food, the sun, the beaches, <laughs> both times were great experiences. Yeah. And if I was going to call out just a couple of others just quickly, I think what's old is new again. And, you know, in Australia, we have this great tradition of blending Cabernet and Shiraz. And we don't really have too much Merlot in Australia. So it sort of makes a lot of sense that that's kind of our unique style, a unique wine style. And it kind of went out of fashion for a while. And over the last 17 years, I think it is, two wine writers, Matthew Dukes from Britain and Tyson Stelzer from Australia, they sort of 
made a big push behind what they call the Great Australian Red, so these Shiraz Cabernet blends or Cabernet Shiraz blends, and they've really come back into vogue. Grenache as well is really having a moment, and then there's some producers that are sort of really getting well known for their what we call alternative varieties or appropriate varieties for the climate here. And there's some really great examples of Australian Sangiovese and many other great varieties as well. So there's lots there's lots happening here, really. Oh, wow. Lots to explore. Because I remember on my trips, I just love the GSM, the, the Grenache, Shiraz, Movedra or Matero blends that are reminiscent also of the Rhone, but of course have definitely an Australian signature in taste. But they were just gorgeous blends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do you have any iconic pairings? I know this is broad, but Australian food and wine pairing that you've had. I think it's probably hard to just go past, you know, like a Hunter Semillon, you know, that's one of our uniquely Australian styles that no one can do around the world quite like we do and just so beautiful with some seafood, you know, just not some seafood that is just fresh and obviously we all live around the coast in Australia and where I am in Sydney, we're on the coast and so a glass of Hunter Semillon with maybe some oysters and prawns, it's pretty hard to beat that really. <laughs> oh, it is. That you're bringing back memories because the first trip I was on assignment for Air Canada on Route Magazine, which was a nice gig to get because they flew me first class. But I landed in Sydney, had to go around to all the restaurants to write this article and then go down to the Hunter Valley. And I just remember falling in love with Semillon, especially mature Semillon. I was told goes through sort of a maybe a, a mute or dumb stage and then comes out the other end as it's aged. These beautiful, hard to describe, but sort of lanolin and wool and wax. And it was just so beautiful, the taste and the, the mouthfeel, so voluptuous. Yeah, absolutely. Was, I'll never forget that. So what do you think the greatest challenges are that the Australian wine industry faces right now? Aside from, of course, you've got the big tariffs from China. That's hard. But are there other trends, challenges that the industry faces? I think the number one thing is just kind of overcoming this perception that Australian wine means the big, you know, high alcohol, rich, heavily oaked styles of wine that most people would been, have been likely to have come across from the Barossa. I mean, I think that even sort of the signature Barossa style has evolved over time and people are by and large, are picking a little bit earlier, and so the, the wines are a little bit more elegant and medium bodied. So that sort of stereotype that people have in their minds about the style of wine that Australia is best known for. But other than that, it's just kind of educating people around the world about yeah the breadth and depth of Australian wine. You know, there's so many wine regions. It's such a big country. So anyone who kind of says I don't like Australian wine, well, I'd challenge them to say that they don't really like wine if they say that because there's styles of wine here that everyone would enjoy and at all quality levels and a tremendous amount of wine that is great value for the standard that it is. When you, like I said before, you know, comparing Australian Chardonnay versus what you pay for a Chablis, they're just not even in the same ballpark. So, and, and our Pinot now as well is great. So I think it's just about understanding what Australian wine really has to offer. Absolutely. And, you know, one of my rookie mistakes when I just started out writing about wine was assuming Australian was all warm climate. But we just talked about all the cool pockets. And there's many regions that provide, as you're saying, such diverse microclimates and soils and influences of bodies of water or rivers. I mean, it's just not all one mammoth rock, if you will. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So what do you think the Australian wine industry needs to do differently? It's got a marketing challenge, but is there anything else that needs to change? I don't know. I think it's just sort of about getting out and it's been hard in the last two years for them to continue to do the work they've been doing from a marketing perspective because obviously people haven't been able to travel and I know that's really damaged Australia a bit in the UK is obviously you've got France and Spain and countries like that. The UK is now our biggest market but in the last two years I think it probably would have grown more if our winemakers have been able to travel over, over there and show their wares to the trade and to media and so forth. So we're at a pretty big disadvantage with how far away we are. But I think it's, yeah, look, it's just about getting the wines into people's hands and getting people to try them because when they do, they understand, oh, hang on, this is not what I thought Australian wine was. And 
you just gradually will for sure expand your fan base. Awesome. So in your sphere of work, like me, you've been fortunate to travel to some pretty glorious places. Tell me about your visit to Champagne. What were the highlights there? Oh, God. It's now thinking about doing things like that when I've been sort of stuck in Sydney. And, you know, there's worse places that you could be stuck and all of that. But, yeah, I I just sort of realized how much that travel for granted. Me too. Yeah. Look, I did a few days in Champagne as a guest of the CIBC a few years ago. You know, they organized my itinerary and sent me around to sort of a really interesting contrasting selection of houses, growers, co-ops. I mean, probably the one experience that I would highlight would probably have been going to Ruinart and, you know, the caves at Ruinart. Underground caves, yeah. Yeah, the underground short caves are just so beautiful. Like, it's really something that if you're a champagne lover to actually go there and to see what those caves are like, it's, it's incredible. And then I sort of interviewed the president of Ruinart and kind of enjoyed a Ruinart Blanc de Blanc with him at the winery and that was pretty hard to beat that whole experiment. Sorry, that whole experience. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I remember visiting Champagne and Palmerie also has an underground network of caves and people don't realize if you haven't been there, some of the caves, the main arteries can be as big as the Champs-Élysées, like the big main roads and their road signs. And, you know, they have branching tunnels that go off of these main arteries and all of these bottles, like millions literally under Rheim, one of the main cities, are just lying, sleeping, cobwebbed, waiting to be dispatched eventually. But it's a magical place to visit. And it smells so fresh. I could believe how beautiful the air was down there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you've also been to Alsace. I've never been there yet. So tell us what was the highlight of Alsace, the border of Germany and France? Some of the most beautiful countryside that I've seen. It's just so so picture perfect, some of the scenes of these vineyards on a hill with a little church that's probably been there for hundreds of years. And some really beautiful Riesling, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer that I've sort of never really experienced quite like that in Australia. And same with Pinot Gris as well. Amazing, amazing few days there. Really, you know what some of these media trips like, you're up at almost at dawn and you go and visit 10 wineries in a day and it's exhausting. It is. But no one's ever going to give us any sympathy. No, there's no sympathy. It's like they just stare at you when when you say that. It's like, really? That's so hard. Of course, you remember (laughs) the best parts of the experience of what stay with you the most and I really love my time in Alsace. Amazing food, you know, as well. Yeah, I've heard so so much about the food. What are the big dishes there? Like, why is the food so good there? Well, they do this thing called tart flambe, which is a little bit like a pizza, but the base is like much lighter. And yeah, I love pizza and I love tart flambe. It's delicious. Like it might have, some of them have snails on them or whatever, and I'm not much into that. But yeah, tart flambe is really good. Is it fired? Like, is there a flambe part or is it like a fired oven or something? It's a fired oven, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, look, beautiful terrines, beautiful sort of, I think there's a bit of a German influence there as well with sort of some of the sausages and stuff. And yeah, great, great food, really unique. Ha, huh, great. All right, let's turn to a lightning round of quicker questions. What's something that you believe about wine that maybe others would disagree with you about that? We kind of touched on this before and it was, <laughs> I wrote that... Oh, the Australian wines? <laughs> no, it was most natural wine. It's oh, the natural yeah. wines. Gotcha. Yes. yes. Oh, it's good to have different opinions and bring a fresh perspective. <laughs> yes, we did cover that. You're right. Do you have a favorite childhood food that you'd pair with wine today as an adult? Well, I've been a pizza lover all my life and I'd probably go with a nice Sangiovese or a Chianti. Ah, with what type of pizza? Probably just a pepperoni pizza. Sounds good. Sounds good. What's the weirdest food and wine pairing you've ever had? Well, this brought to mind an event that I went to for Tattinger Champagne, which was an American barbecue restaurant. And, you know, American barbecue, you kind of think of big, burly guys with beards, craft beer. It doesn't really bring to mind champagne. But look, you know, what's not to love about drinking Tattinger Champagne? It went fine with the American barbecue, I thought. Wow. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. I have to try that one. <laughs> 
What is your favorite wine book or one of them? Yeah, this is an interesting one. I mean, this Nosedive by Harold McGee. Ah, oh, okay. I don't know okay. if you're familiar with it. It's, so it's a field guide to the world's smells. Oh, right. Oh, he's the scientist. He does all sorts of food and science. The book is just incredible. He went around smelling every possible thing that you could think of from, you know, the worst smells to the best smells and kind of unpacks why it is that, for example, wines remind us of other things like, you know, you might say a Cabernet Cabernet has notes of bay leaf, for example. And obviously most of the time that stuff is underpinned by the same flavour molecules are in both things. And so if you've ever kind of thought, oh, that smell reminds me of this, Nosedive is great to be able to dig into understanding some of that stuff. So it's not strictly a wine book, but... Right, but still so tied closely about the essential of wine, which is its smell. For anyone who's interested in sensory, good night. I had Harold on the podcast and it was one of my favorite interviews too. I bet you he would be amazing. Oh my gosh. Wow, that's great. Do you have a favorite wine gadget? Yeah, I chose for this one Wine Save Pro. Oh, yes, the preserve spray sort yeah, of. Yeah, it's just if I've got a nice bottle open, I always hate to waste it. And I do find Wine Save is pretty good for dosing it with a bit of gas to sort of reduce the exposure to oxygen and it'll last a little bit longer and hold up a little bit better overnight or over a couple of days, depending on how full the bottle is. So, yeah. That's true. I've got preserve spray and it just, as you say, it flushes out the oxygen that's in the empty part of the bottle and replaces it with a blanket of whatever it is, nitrogen or something. Argon. Argon. (laughs) Argon. There you go. Right, right, right. Yes, absolutely. If you could put up a billboard in downtown Sydney, what would it say? Well, shameless self-promotion, but probably subscribe to the Drinks Adventures podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Good one. Good one. Why not? Free advertising. (laughs) That's great. That's great. You're very practical, James. (laughs) Which wine would you like served at your own funeral? Not to get too morbid, but... Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, I wouldn't want people to dwell on it and get too sad. So maybe a beautiful vintage champagne like, say, Paul Roger, Winston Churchill, for example. Lovely. I'm coming to your funeral. Let me know. No, anyway, as we wrap up our conversation, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention? Yeah, well, I think maybe just, you know, what is the worst advice people get about wine? Sure. I think the one that I kind of see the most is to serve red wine at room temperature. Now, in Australia, room temperature could be upwards of 22 degrees Celsius and maybe a lot warmer than that. And so the amount of times I'm in a restaurant, sadly, and get brought a glass of red wine that's just been served at room temperature, and it really doesn't look the best. And it's no. really and it not as enjoyable. And it feels and tastes like soup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I sometimes, if I'm buying a whole bottle and I taste it and then I realize it's too warm, I'll ask for an ice bucket for a, a bottle yes. of bread. Yeah. Even if you'll get strange looks, it's the thing yeah, to do. That's right. Yeah. It's more refreshing. So now how can people get in touch with you online, find your podcast and so on? Here's your billboard moment. Go for it. <laughs> the simplest way is probably, you know, the website drinksadventures.com.au or you can find me on all social media at by James Atkinson, B-Y James Atkinson. Drinks Adventures is on Instagram too, at drinksadventures underscore AU. Great. Well, we've got podcast listeners listening to us right now, obviously, and so they'll find your podcast as well, wherever they get this podcast. So James, I loved our conversation. I'm looking forward to chatting with you again, because I'm going to chat with you on your podcast. But this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) Okay, James, cheers for now. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with James. Here are my takeaways. Number one, his descriptions of Australian wines made me not only want to revisit the wine styles, but also to go back to Australia itself. It was such a magical place. Two, James makes some important points about cool climate Australian wines and how elegant and balanced they are to the point where they can be confused with Burgundian wines, especially when it comes to Chardonnay. And three, 
I loved his iconic Australian wine and food pairing suggestions and cannot wait to try them. In the show notes, you'll find links to James' website and podcast, my free online pairing class, the video versions of these chats. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 176. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or want to be a beta reader of my new memoir at natalie at nataliemclean.com. You won't want to miss next week when we chat with Andrea Smalling, Chief Marketing Officer at Wine Direct, and Kathy Hoya, Forbes Wine Columnist and CEO at Enalytics. They've recently co-authored a groundbreaking report on the wine industry that will be of interest to those who make, sell, and buy wine, from wineries to consumers. In the meantime, if you missed episode 59, go back and take a listen. I chat about bargain wines, pairing wine with artichokes, and wine region vacation tips. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Artichokes are one of the most difficult foods to pair up with wine, and it's notoriously true. There was a reality show. I think it was Hell's Kitchen. Was Hell's no, Kitchen? no, it was, it was uh, Top Chef. It was Top Chef first season. One of the final challenges was, was to put together a, a food and wine extravaganza. You know, a whole dinner, and uh, w- one of the finalists chose artichokes show. prominently in our dinner. And every wine person in the world smacked their head and said, "No, not artichokes." If you remember Tiffany in the in the in the finals, blew it on the artichokes. She put artichokes. Oh, oh she, it was it was just it was one of those things when as you were watching her doing it. If you're a wine person, right. you when said, she conceptualized the, the menu, she said the word in. artichokes, and everybody went, "No, <laughs> why? Why are artichokes so difficult, Natalie?" Well, they have an organic acid, cinnarin, that stimulates our taste bud sugar receptors and fools us into thinking that everything we eat or drink afterwards is sweeter than it actually is, even water. So you can imagine how that plays havoc with wine. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a cool climate Australian Chardonnay. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.